My name is Madeline Boyd, and today I'll be talking about how to handle permissions correctly by removing the need to worry about checking them. If you work on a system which involves permissions or sharing, I hope you'll learn something from this talk. The title comes from the expression to fall into the pit of success. That is, to have the easiest default be the correct course. For example, if you're designing an API or framework, you want developers to fall into the pit of success, whereas by not trying, they end up doing the correct thing anyway. In this case, I wanted to avoid permissions bugs by having permission checking be built into the ORM itself. When Business Logic queries the database, it should only return results the requesting user has the permission to see. Model object edits or deletes should only be allowed if the requesting user has permission to make those changes and return an error otherwise. So permission checking for standard CRUD operations, so create, read, update, and delete, should be built into the API itself. So quick outline, spoiler alert, uh, this talk fits into the I had a problem and I couldn't find the right solution, so I built a solution archetype. My problem was the risk of permission bugs and human error. I wanted to automate them away. So I'll talk about the solution I built. In addition, I'll discuss um, some other details about it. So both checking for at the model level, like whether someone has permissions to compute, to read or update a particular model, but also fields on that model as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about related fields, how to handle permissions on those and also how we implemented ACLs for specific allow listing of permissions on particular objects. Um, and I'll also, towards the end, discuss some considerations for using this uh, of solution like the one I have discussed, um, when it may be overkill, uh, when it might, like, and how to mitigate potential issues with it, such as um, it being slow if used in the wrong way. So I'll, before we, before I go further, I'll talk a little bit more about the problem statement and the motivating factors for why I went into all this hassle. So I'm trying to build a website where it's really easy to both share and lock down data um, working in bit.io. Uh, so think Google Docs, but with Postgres. So you can upload data, get a relational database really quickly, um, work in that data, but more importantly, share it with people, collaborate with friends or colleagues, um, and allow them to at, have access to your data. But also having, being able to have some somewhat finely grained permissions um, that so you can give read access to some people, write access to others, um, admin permission to trusted colleagues. Um, you can make your data public so the entire world can see it. And um, you can also prevent bad actors from having access to your data. So only the people you allow and you want should be able to have access to your data. So that being said, uh, databases are boring. So my forthcoming examples will use Cake instead. So I looked at the existing solutions for managing permissions in Django, and I'll give a quick overview of what's out there. So I in particular needed a system which would support subject verb object permissions, which are not supported in Django by default. So you can say that Alice has the eat cake permission, but you can't say that Alice has permission to eat Bob's cake, but not Charlie's. You could programmatically declare new permissions for each permission object pair, like eat Bob cake, but that quickly gets unwieldy, especially if you support dynamically created or user created objects, or um, God forbid there's naming overlap or permission naming overlap. Um, so this on the left is how the Django built-in permission system checks things. You have a user, uh, which is the request.user, request and you can, you can return whether or not they have a particular permission um, defined as app label and then permission name. Um, but there's no way, you can't pass an object into this permission check. So if you wanna do something like that, like on the right, um, then you have to use something like Django rules or Django guardian. So Django Guardian is the most popular solution for this, for having object level permissions. It's great for the ACL case uh, because for, if you want to say that Alice has permission to eat Bob's cake, you would call some code that just allow lists Alice as having the eat cake permission on Bob's cake. Similarly to check permissions, you would explicitly check in the code, does Alice have eat cake permission on Bob's cake? Yes, all right, 
let her eat cake. Um, it's popular. It's been around. Uh, it's stable. Um, but the f you have to do these manual permissions def definitions and checking. And I wanted something that was more automatic. Um, Django rules is more in the direction of what I in particular needed. Um, it's fast, it's in memory, um, and it allows you to define predicates to say whether or not a given subject has a given permission on a given object. And those predicates are short functions that you can define and map to that permission name on a given model class. Uh, but you still have to remember to manually check these permissions at runtime. So you, if, if you give a list, if you want to fetch a list of cakes and only return the ones that... Um, you, that a particular user has permission to see, you have to remember to explicitly filter out the ones in which someone doesn't have permission. Um, so for an, I'll give a quick example of how you might add permissions in Django rules. So let's say I have some delicious cake and I want to make sure that anyone who is either my friend or likes cake can have some, except for Adam, he knows why. It would look something like this. So I define my cake model, I have my rules permissions dictionary, um, and then I specify the permission name as the key in that dictionary um, on the classes, on the model classes meta class, and specify the predicates. So with Django rules predicates, you can string them together with Boolean operators, you can do ands or ors in line, which is nice. And so in this case, I would define the permissions for eating cake as such. Um, you cannot be Adam, and you, um, if you're my, like, I can actually define relations as part of the permission. So is a requester um, in like my user objects, friends, many to many array. So it's kind of cool. Um, but what happens here if you, it can be bad if you forget to check this permission and you accidentally let someone who is not my friend or somehow like Adam gets through and because I forgot to check and so he gets some cake, like that would be terrible. Um, or, but you could not only forget the permission check, but you could also check the wrong permission or you can like have it someone new who just joined who doesn't know which permission to check. Um, so wouldn't it be nice? You could try to catch all these things at code review, but you know, cause every bug ever gets caught at code review. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if the system did the right thing and only the returned objects and details if the system only returned objects and details, which the currently active requester had permission to see. Um, so instead of something at the, here at the top, which is how you might filter out only the cakes that I have permission to see um, in Jager rules, if we had something like the bottom. So a more, if not all of y'all are building cake gallery sites, um, another example might be um, user profiles. So let's say I'm going to a website and I want to make sure that like people have different, there are different user accounts and different people have their profiles. But you only want to allow, allow listed connections to see your profile. So you're not exposing the profile to the entire world. Maybe you want to lock it down to only authenticated users or um, only users where you've explicitly have some kind of connection, whether it's like friend or LinkedIn connection or you're collaborating in a particular document. Um, that might be a case where you would need to do something like this, where you want to filter out a list of view of models that only a given person, person can see. So what I'm going towards and would be what I would like to have is something like the bottom where I just have a, in this case, it would be a custom model manager that gives me the list of just the, just the model objects that the request.user has permission to see. So now I'll talk a little bit, so that's the existing solutions that are out there. Now I'll talk a little bit about what I built and how it worked for me. Um, and specifically, I'll start off by focusing on permission checks at the whole model layer. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more later on about how to do field specific permission checks. So this is how you can bake these permission checks into the ORM to get those nice pre-filtered queries. So here's how you might go about it. So the first step is to store the active requester, request.user in most cases, as a thread local variable. Um, so this is so it's in scope, so you can have it, even if you're not passing it in as an argument towards, um, like for here, where there's filtered objects does not take a requester as an, ob as an argument, you can still reference the current requesting user when you're making these permission checks and computing these queries. 
Um, I say request.user in most cases because uh, we also, for bit.io, we support logged out users. Uh, the idea was we wanted to allow people to try out the functionality of the website without having to sign up for an account. Um, so we have a different kind of requester that does not map to request.user um, because in those cases, uh, request.user is just anonymous, but we wanted to have a unique user model object, which we keyed off of the session key. Um, if you have more questions about that, talk to me after. Um, we also, to implement this, need to override some model and query set of manager methods. This essentially requires that uh, we have a custom base, a custom subclass of query set, a custom subclass of model, and a custom subclass of manager um, that we can use to string through all the permission checks and make sure the right permissions are checked for the right um, actions. And then finally, uh, raise permission denied if the requester doesn't have permission to take a particular action or filter out uh, model objects the requester does not have permission to see. So here's how we stash their current requester um, so we can access it globally, but it's still scoped by thread. Um, we also have middleware uh, to, and to like take the request and make sure we're setting the requester object to be request.user or the current logged out the current logged out user um, before the request and make sure we unset it at the end of the request so we don't have weaking of requester across requests because that that can lead to some really interesting privacy bugs. Um, and this also, this method also makes it easier to access the current requester by just calling requester.get. Um, so for here's what you would, here's the other methods that you will need to override. Uh, so fetch all query set fetch all is the workhorse of the Django ORM. This is the method that takes a query set fetches that data from the database and returns it and hydrates Python objects um, that you can then manipulate. So if you override this, you can get pretty far. Um, and what, in our case, what we do is we override fetch all, um, take the result set and filter out, um, filter out the objects that the given requester would not have permission to see based on their current permissions. Um, also need to override manager.query get query set to pass in our custom query set model, which has the overridden fetch all. And um, also need to override model.save and model.delete so we can enforce permissions on creates, updates, and deletes. So here is how you this is a summary of how we override fetch all. Um, this excludes how we this excludes how we handle for related permissions or re reverse relations, which I'll get to later in this talk. But basically, call super fetch all. It populates a result cache. Filter out everything in the result cache that doesn't pass permissions. Um, the permission check is uh, basically by default allows for filtering out um, like the. The default permission here in the perm check list is going to be view model. But if you want to have custom permissions, um, you can add them in here. And that's how, you, that's how you can add them to the query set and then still have the query set respect those permissions. Um, this is also how we handle release, uh, reverse permissions um, on related models. So I'll talk a little bit about how we um, handle per field privacy, but before I get into it, I want to give a quick overview of fields and descriptors. Um, this is kind of like, if this were live, I would pull you guys and ask like, how many of you know what descriptors are, but I'll just go through it. You can skip and fast forward if you know this stuff. Um, so fields and descriptors, what are they? A uh, field is um, in Django, it is the, it's a property on a model class that maps to a column in the underlying table that stores all the information about that model in your database. So if you have a cake model, um, that will correspond to a cake table somewhere in your backing data database. And each row in that table will be mapped to a cake instance. And each column in that table will map to a cake field. Um, so, but you have fields defined on the class, but then you have instances of that class, but which also have properties with the same name as the field. So what's, how does that map? How does that, the field attribute map to the 
class, their instance attribute. Well, uh, Django uses something called descriptors. And descriptors are a fun magic Python uh, design pattern where you have a class that pretends like it's a property and has this magic method underscore underscore get underscore underscore and underscore underscore set underscore underscore, which allow this class object to pretend like it's a property on another class. Like it's like a weird symbiotic relationship. So here's a pretty minimal example. Um, the benefit of descriptors is that you can have dynamically computed property lookups. So here you have a class called time and time is a descriptor here and it has a method called underscore underscore get underscore underscore, which returns the current time. Then you have another class called A with two properties, one of which is a standard property called five that always just returns five, and a second property called now, which will return the current time if you call it. Um, so you have you create an instance of A, and you call a.five, returns five, great, awesome. But then you have a.now, and if you call a.now, even though now is as a property defined on the A class, if you call now on an instance of A, then you will turn the current time. And it's weird because a.now is actually a descriptor, but it's returning a value. And that's because of the underscore underscore get magic, which basically says um, if, you're, if this is a property on something and you're calling get, return this value. Don't return the actual instance itself. So uh, how are descriptors used in Django? Well, descriptors are what the Django ORM attaches to model instances to return whatever the, val that, whatever the value of that field is for that instance. Um, so you can think of fields as being defined on classes and descriptors as being defined on instances. It's tricky because their descriptors are hidden from you. You won't really know they're there unless you do some introspecting. And that's because in this case, if you have an instance of the cake class and it has a flavor field and you call cake.flavor, it won't say descriptor, it'll just say vanilla, um, as you can see in this a little bit more elaborate example. And so how does, so in this example, uh, time, the descriptor is defined on the class, but in Django, you have um, you define fields on the class, not descriptors. So how is the descriptor getting in there? Well, um, what Django does is each field has a method called contribute to class. And all that it pretty much does is it iterates through the fields that are defined on it, and then it creates descriptors and then also sets them on that class so that subsequent instances will get those descriptors. Um, it's just, it's kind of like boilerplate, I guess. Uh, so in this case, if you have a flavor descriptor where underscore underscore get returns vanilla, um, this is how all birthday cakes that have a flavor field will always have vanilla as their flavor. Um, so if you've worked with the Django RM, you've probably customized some of these fields. This is how that works under the hood. So now getting back to how we are talking about per field privacy. So um, if you will permit me to use an ice cream metaphor in lieu of cake for a slide, um, I will use an example from my childhood to describe how you might implement field, uh, field level privacy, which is the permission to get or set a particular field on a model class that may or may not be different from the permissions on the model as a whole. So for instance, like I, maybe I'm viewing a user profile, um, but like there is an email address attached to that, but like I don't have permission to see that email, only the person who has that profile does. That, that's like one example. So I can see the user, but I can't see the email field um, because of custom permissions. So um, ice cream metaphor. Growing up, there was a restaurant chain called Friendly's that had these ice cream sundaes that had a secret surprise of a mystery candy at the bottom. So it could be gummy bears or M&Ms, Skittles, you know. Um, so you could only access that secret surprise at the bottom if you had completely eaten the whole sundae, which was definitely incentive to eat the sundae quickly and get a tummy ache. Um, and you can only set that secret surprise or configure that secret surprise if you are a friendly employee, because if you were a random stranger across the street and, or just walking along and you tried to sneak candy into the bottom of ice cream that was going to be handed to children, 
uh, you would probably get arrested. So if I were to represent the Friendly's Ice Cream Sunday as a model class, it would have a secret surprise field with custom permissions. So I may be able to view and eat the whole Sunday, but I can only view and eat, I can only know what the secret surprise is or that it even exists once I've completely eaten the whole Sunday. Because there was every once in a while there's a very sad day where there's no secret surprise and it's, it's terrible. Um, to set the secret surprise, you must be a Friendly's employee. So you could define the predicates like this. Um, so that's an example of a use case of per-field privacy. Um, but to implement it, uh, when declaring a field on a model, you need to use a custom field class. And you must also use a custom descriptor, which you have to thread through. And then the descriptor in its underscore underscore get method will check the permission that you've defined on that field um, and then say, does the requester have this permission? If so, return the value. If not, um, then raise permission denied. So how you do that plumbing is in your overridden field class, you implement the contribute to class method um, and then you override that. So this is what you might do with it. You call super to add all the other fields but then you also overwrite the descriptor that it's added with your own custom topping descriptor. Um, so if you want to have a permission on like a particular topping, this is also how you pass in the permission names. So you can define the permission names on the field um, itself uh, in this. So in this case, in this topping field, I've defined the view perm name to be view surprise and the change perm name to be change surprise. So you define the field, you add the permission names in the init method, you plumb them through in the descriptor underscore underscore get, you check those permissions or underscore underscore set for changing them. And that's how you implement permissions on um, a field. That works for your standard primitive fields like text field, in field, etc. But for related fields, you need to do something else. So related fields are a way to have fields that point to other model classes. And you can have one-to-one -one fields, you can have foreign key, which is just one-to-many, or you can have many-to-many -many fields. Um, for those, you must, in addition to implementing created contribute to class, you must also implement contribute to related class and set your custom descriptor in that. Um, so that's because for related fields, there is also the reverse permission. So if I have a, say there's like, class A and class B, and I have some field like a.friends. Um, and I want to also say, okay, if I, I don't have permission to see A's friends, um, and B is one of A's friends. And then if I do B.friends, I want to make sure A is excluded from that list. So this is where, that's like one example of making sure that you do the related permission check as well. Um, you also have to override something called related manager class. And that's because when you do something like a.friends or cake.toppings, cake.toppings is actually a related manager. So it's both a descriptor and a related manager. Um, so you need to override that. The problem is, is that that is set at runtime. So what you need to do to override the related manager class is you need to override related manager class call super, take that class, dynamically subclass that with your own class, and then um, pass in the permission checks there. So it looks a little bit like this. So related manager class is a method that gets called at runtime, um, computes what the related manager class should be for a.friends or cake.toppings. Um, and then what we do is we override that related manager, override get query set, pass in our own special query set or add our own permission checks um, to make sure that we're checking a reverse permission as well um, and then return that class. So there's a lot of overriding and diamondism because Python is cool, so why not? All right, so important side note. Um, so again, I would ask like how many people are familiar with default manager versus base manager. It comes in handy when you're overriding your related managers with custom stuff like this. Um, so the default manager, you can have to be whatever you want. Most people set it to just be objects, but you can, it doesn't have to be objects. It can be anything, anything else you want, like filtered objects, et cetera. 
And then that's what get used as for the default manager in this related manager class. There's also something called base manager, which is you want it to, it's very rare that you actually want to override this because this is what Django uses under the hood to compute certain kinds of relations and joins and overriding it can break Django. So just make sure your default manager is your overridden manager subclass. So the relations pick up the right thing, but the base manager should be the original Django manager class. Um, this is just some text in the documentation about why this is important. Uh, if you go to the Django docs managers page, you can find this. It's All right, so ACLs. Um, I'll talk a little bit quickly about this. Um, so this is, if all you care about is ACLs, then something like Django Guardian will probably work great for you. Where you are explicitly allow listing or setting, or explicitly setting permissions that people have permissions in a particular thing. So if you are like serving a birthday cake at a party and you want to explicitly say that like Timmy, like Johnny, whoever is invited, that they, you can create ACLs for them um, and that they are on this list and that maybe there's like a special like birthday girl and she has a special birthday girl role. So she gets to eat the cake first and blow out the candles and everyone else can like eat it. But like, so you're explicitly configuring which objects have which permission on that or which subjects have a given permission or which particular permissions on a particular object. Um, so Here's how we implement it. Um, we have an ACL model. And um, originally we were using generic foreign keys. Uh, so foreign keys or most Django relations can only point to one other type of class. So what happens when you wanna have a normal user and um, a, you wanna have an ACLs point to both or uh, logged in user and maybe a logged out user class or two different classes, but they should both be able to be the accessor on an ACL. Um, and like also a resource, you may want to have the same ACL class mapped to different resources. So maybe cakes, maybe pies, maybe in our case, um, when we're sharing databases, it could be like a repository or a schema permission or a table within that schema or a column permission. Um, so different types of objects we want to set ACLs for. Um, one way you can do that is with generic foreign keys, um, which is what we did initially. Uh, we moved away from it because it made a few things tricky. Um, it By breaking the Django database model abstraction where relations are links between tables or making it tricky, it made it difficult to compute certain performance optimizations and it made migrations and um, the ability to do certain kinds of intro introspection very difficult. So we moved to a pattern of delegates where we have an access, every, the ACL always points to an accessor delegate class that accessor delegate or resource delegate classes have a series of one-to-one -one nullable blankable fields, only one of which will actually ever be non-none that points to whatever the accessor for that should be. So if we have a logged in user class and a logged out user class, um, the accessor delegate will have um, a logged in user field and a logged out user field, it will only one of those will be valid. And if you do accessor delegate dot value or accessor delegate dot owner, it will point to the one that is not valid or the one that is not none. Um, so that's how we, we do that instead of generic foreign keys. And it makes it a bit easier to do things like prefetching, um, where you're prefetching across different fields, um, or compute other kinds of fields and filters. Um, we also have different roles. So you can have, for example, an admin role, a reader role, a writer role, um, and one giant enum, and the same type of ACLs to be used for all of those. So that's the overview of how this works. And I'll talk about a few considerations or things to keep in mind before jumping in and using a solution like this. So the main consideration to be aware of here is performance. Um, if you are making database calls in the predicates where you're checking permissions um, or you're doing a lot of redundant permission checks, it can be slow. The best way to get around this is to prefetch the fields that you know you will need in making those um, permission checks. So essentially prefetching all of the fields that you will need when you fetch the field for the first time, 
um, for any permission checks on that on that model so that you don't have to re return to the database to fetch them again. Um, so we wrote some code to raise an exception if a database call is happening in a predicate, which helped us catch these things. Um, I recommend that. We're also looking into an easier solution for this, aside from is to e either allow list or write a function, which is uh, permission names I need for prefetching and then just always prefetch those. Um, we're looking into maybe writing a tool that can infer what things need to be fetched prefetched at runtime, but we haven't had the time to do that yet. So if you're curious about that or you want a nice technical challenge, talk to me after this. Um, so another way to speed up permission checks is to check once explicitly what you need to check and then override permission checks in the next chunk of your business logic. If you're doing this all the time, then Django rules or Django Guardian will work for you because you're always explicitly checking permissions. What, like I find that's mostly useful in um, more custom cases. So as an example, so on the left, um, don't do this. Uh, this is doing, this is conducting permission checks without prefetching the right fields. Um, on the right, this is nice. This is what I would recommend um, because this is prefetching all of the fields that you would need to do those permission checks. So they are all fetched from the database the first time you go there. Um, and then for prefetch related, they're joined in Python so that you don't have to recompute. Select related is joins all of the SQL layer. So another consideration, uh, this solution may be overkill if you don't have that many, if your permission checks are infrequent or you don't have that many dynamically generated objects or your permission checking doesn't follow a CRUD pattern, like you're not checking permissions mostly on views, creates, updates, deletes. Um, or maybe you don't want your permissions checks to be explicit because you don't trust magic generally uh, and you'd rather be explicit what's going on in the code than don't do something like this. And then finally, um, this solution, it's not really a framework, it's, but it's not a library. Library, I think of like, I can plug in, I can call its methods, it does what I want. In this case, you have to override your the base model and manager classes. So it's essentially a drop-in replacement for the Django ORM. Um, in general, I think we should use fewer frameworks and more libraries, um, but this is the best way I could find to accomplish this particular goal. And it's, it's not as invasive as it could be. So that is the overview. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, so I've built this and I could open source it. I just haven't yet because I'm not sure who else would need it. If you think this is cool or you'd want to work on it or you would like to use this in your own project, let me know and I will happily, I can put in the work to do the open sourcing. Um, so reach out to me. I'm Madeline Boyd at Twitter. Uh, that is a very weird spelling of Madeline. There is a second A in it. My mother thought it was the more normal spelling of the name, um, whatever. Um, or you can reach me at boyd at bit.io. It's fewer letters and easier to type. Um, pick your favorite communication medium and let me know. Um, and once again, thank you so much for coming and watching this talk. And uh, thank you for, I hope you learned something. Thank you to the Django conference, organize, Django con organizers who put in the work to put this all together. Uh, if you have any feedback for me or you think that my talk, uh, anything I could have clarified more or just feedback in general, um, again, reach out to me here. Um, but thank you and um, happy programming. I'd love to thank my team at Bit.io who made the system happen. We're hiring backend software engineers just like you. If you'd like to join us or what we're working on sounds interesting to you, reach out to me at void at bit.io. Thank you.